Welcome back. This is the Big Blue Banter, New York Giants football podcast. I'm Dan Schneier, joined as always my co-host Nick Filato. And today we're welcoming back on a reoccurring guest. I think I was thinking about this before we started the recording. This might be the guest we've now had on the show the most total times. And in addition to that, it's also probably the guest that you guys have said you most want back on the show the most amount of time. So it kind of works perfect for us if it works for him. And he's given us his time again today. So we're welcoming back on David Cyberston from our lads. And he's going to tell us a little bit about not only the Giants today, but he's going to talk a little bit about the 2024 NFL draft. I know a lot of people talk to us and say sometimes like, can we get some takes early on the draft? And Nick and I are always like, yeah, if we had 48 hours in a day, maybe we could do some <laughs> draft talk early. But like, no, no, the reality is I don't know crap until January. Okay. And that's all I can do. But yeah. the good news is, Cy does a lot more than that. Um, so how are you doing today, Cy? Awesome, man. This is the stress-free time of year. You know, there's less deadlines. There's less expectations of being accurate with a lot of things. And, uh, you know, at any point, you know, no matter what we say right now, we, we can go back and, you know, retract our words, you know, after the game tapes come out in the fall, which is the most important part. Uh, but right now, it's just, it's a little bit more relaxed. Uh, I try to get stuff in every day, but by no means is it anything compared to, the last time we talked, especially when I had pink eye, and looked like I was a, a zombie last time I was on with you guys. So, yeah, definitely a little bit more relaxed now, but still, it's I could tell, you know, once July 4th is in the rearview mirror, things start to pick up a little bit. Now that we have some action in training camp to watch and talk about and new contracts to talk about, you, you, can, you can sense it's coming, that the intensity of this whole process is about to begin. And I'm uh, more than happy to be on with you guys. I love talking ball with you guys. David, it's always excellent to have you on. Thank you so much for joining us. And I want to start with one of those new contracts. We briefly touched on it on the last podcast, but we wanted to get your opinion on this Saquon Barkley fiasco, this Saquon Barkley drama. I, for one, and I'm happy that he's here for the 2023 season, and he's back now on a one-year deal. So how do you feel about that entire ordeal? I mean, what happened over the past, I would say, one to two weeks, you know, especially with kind of like the fake news stories about guys taking one quote from an hour and 15 minute <laughs> interview and trying to spin it to something that could make the, uh, the New York post headlines about, you know, Barkley talking poorly about the giants. I never had a fear that Barkley would be playing elsewhere or holding out or even not playing in, in 2023. That never really crossed my mind. I didn't know, however, if it would be under a franchise tag or under a long-term deal. Both of those were wrong. I didn't even envision this being a possibility that they take a one year deal slightly higher than the franchise tag. And it just shows that both sides work together on this. Uh, I do think Barkley's representation dropped the ball in season. If those rumors are true, I think he could have been locked into a three year deal more expensive than what he would be getting right now. And it, it's unfortunate, right? I do feel for running backs and that whole market about they're, they're just not getting the value that they used to. But this is business. You know, this is not, these are not feelings that, you know, you, you, you have to kind of get past, you know, feeling, especially a guy that's making $11 million. Let's not feel too bad for him, right? But I think that the game has changed. And we all know that the quarterback contracts are getting unbelievable. And when you see that coming, you see a contract that Daniel Jones is getting, what Justin Herbert just got, what Joe Burrow is going to get. You know, there's going to be some take from other areas of the roster and running back because they are, it is an easier position to fill is, you know, through the draft or through cheap free agency. It's understood and, and almost agreeable that these guys should be getting less money than the mar than what they used to in terms of percentage of team spending. But let's not overlook this fact. Saquon Barkley is the best football player on this offense. Christian McCaffrey was the best football player on the Niners offense last year. They do make a difference. And, you know, to, to say that running back value is down is a fact. To say that they're no longer effective and pieces that you can build with a winning football team, I think that's going a little too strong in that direction. So I think everyone that supports the Giants should be ecstatic that this happened. And I would not close the door on him getting a long-term deal at this time next year. I think it's really interesting what you mentioned there last there, Cy, because we had the discussion with Bobby yesterday about whether whether, you know, this decision impacts Barkley's future with the Giants, because before this, Nick and I discussed 
we felt like after the tag, that was kind of it. That was like basically a sign that this is you're not here long term. But this kind of opens the door maybe for a different kind of future for Barkley, especially in my mind, should the Giants win again this year. Now, if the Giants lose this year, finish seven and nine, six and ten, something like that, whatever, or seven and ten, six and eleven. I keep forgetting about the extra game. I think that does impact his future. And I don't think I think they might move on a different direction there. Yeah. But I like that this opens the door to him potentially being here long term. Should the giant, you know, should the Giants feel that's necessary? I wanted to ask you about the other big contract we saw in recent days, and this was actually this morning. Andrew Thomas, a five-year, one hundred seventeen point five million dollar contract, sixty-seven million guaranteed, and the cap hit for year one is around five million, which means some of that will be backloaded. Giants giving themselves flexibility now in case they need to sign a linebacker, maybe another edge. These are positions the Giants might need help at, or if injuries strike unexpectedly, that could be another area. Area where we don't even know the position that they want to spend at one. Do you like the structure of the deal? And two, do you like the idea of them getting him signed now before maybe next off season where it will be more expensive? Yeah. So there's two parts to this, right? If they had waited till after next season and Andrew Thomas put together another all pro caliber season, the price tag goes up immediately, especially considering that there's going to be other potential suitors that can come in and grab him at any point. So getting him locked up before he's even allowed to go uh, investigate the open market was a huge deal. I had a feeling they were going to do this prior to the start of the season, and I'm ecstatic that they got it done before training camp. Uh, the other side of it is the age factor. If you remember back to when Dave Gettleman, who we have to give him some credit for what's been going on with this current Giants roster, Dexter Lawrence, Daniel Jones, Saquon Barkley, and Andrew Thomas. Some of them were controversial first-round picks. They just got locked into big deals. Barclays is only one year, but again, that's more about the position than the player. Uh, but I don't want to give him too much kudos. Kudos, The guy knows talent. He didn't know how to build a football team, uh, a complete roster, but it, it, he does deserve some of the credit that all these first-round picks are getting locked into, into long-term deals. But if you remember back to that draft in 2020, he was young. And this is one of the reasons why you do need to pay attention to draft age. Uh, how old are these guys when they get drafted? Especially now, some of these guys are playing five, six, seven years. I just wrote someone up last night, wide receiver from Minnesota. It's his seventh year at Minnesota. Injuries are part of the deal, but COVID has added a year to a lot of these guys. And it's not necessarily a factor in year one, year two, year three, year four, right? They're in their mid-20s, the prime of, uh, of their, their body's development. But Andrew Thomas is now going to play this entire second contract, I believe, before he uh, reaches the age of 30. Trent Williams, David Bakhtiari, um, I'm thinking about Teron Armstead, uh, Laramie Tunsil. The risk that those guys, those guys were also making quarterback, oh, former quarterback caliber money, tw mid twenty. $25 million per year against the cap on average, 31, 33, 32 years old. Andrew Thomas is going to be getting paid all this money, which is a huge contract, and it is going to take some from spending on other areas of the roster. But you feel good about it that that entire contract is going to be before the age of 30 years old. And no matter what, when you invest in – a player that much money, especially one that has had some lower body issues and he's not a small guy. So you got to be, there's a little bit of risk here. The fact that the age won't be a factor at all during this entire deal is another major victory for the front office and something to keep in mind in future when you talk about age around draft time. Well, I just thought it was interesting that he mentioned the point about how Andrew Thomas won't even be 30 by the time he reaches, by the time this deal is over, because we've seen now, Trent Williams was the example you brought up, but Andrew Whitworth, we've seen a lot of these tackles be able to play into their late, mid to late 30s. So there's even an opportunity, I think, for Andrew Thomas to give the Giants maybe like a decade plus worth of tackle play at this point of solid. I mean, maybe he won't be the same elite player he was later in his career, but who knows? Trent Williams is still playing at elite level at such a uh, you know late age. Same with Whitworth. So I just thought that was interesting to think about with the age point. But sorry, go on, Nick. So, Sai, is there a message that Joe Shane sent to the locker room and the rest of the league with the several signings that he made this offseason? Because it seemed like the only player that Giant fans and people around the league are saying, like, hey, the Giants might sign this guy to a long-term deal right now is Xavier McKinney, who's the only one who has not yet been signed. And the Giants took care of everybody else. And Saquon Barkley, I know it's a little bit of a separate situation, but they did come to some agreement to him. So do you think that sends a message to the Giants locker room and a message around the league about Joe Shane and how he's handling business here in New York? 
Huge point. I, I think that's the other thing I wanted to talk about with these contracts is homegrown players are going to be taken care of if they take care of their business. Even if the contract puts them in the upper echelon of spending for that position league wide, they'll take care of you and they'll take care of you quick. You know, they'll get it done with a, you know, Saquon Barkley. Maybe the drama was a little bit higher than the other guys, but I still think they avoided some of the crisis that we've seen with other players, right? I mean, the biggest news we saw was that he unfollowed them on Instagram, <laughs> like as if, as if that's a big deal, or, you know, that's, you know, it was a low drama situation with Lawrence, Thomas, Jones, and Barkley. And I also believe that, you know, one thing I want to talk about the Giants in relation to 2023, compared to where we were last year, they've completely turned the ship around. I mean, the Giants, when they took over this team, they had the worst record in the NFL, the lowest winning percentage in the league for over the, a five-year span. It is not a short amount of time. Um, they had the, the bottom five uh, cap spending ability, uh, lowest five uh, cap room when they took over. And the team was terrible on, on all fronts. They didn't know if they had a quarterback um, long-term. They had to replace a, a huge part of the roster last year. They had to cut a quality quarterback in James Bradbury. They go out. Start off 1-0, first time they had a winning record in six years, make the playoffs, win a game on the road in the playoffs. Now that And now this is like a fun situation to be a part of. This is an innovative offense. It's a modern thinking front office. It's a place where players are going to want to go now. And you didn't know that for a long time. The Giants were starting to become, if not that did become, the laughing stock of the league. Now it's a, a hot spot. And, it, you know, they're going to have to produce on the field, and I, it's not going to be easy. We'll get into that, what's going to come up this year compared to what they got to deal with last year. But Joe Shane and Brian Dable, Mike Kafka, Wink Martindale, they deserve the credit as well. This is a, a completely different operation on all fronts, and I think it's an area where team these guys, they want to be here. It, it, they're not here by default. They're not here because they got drafted by the Giants. And that mutual respect, it, it brings the entire product to another level. So I think that the whole culture, that's the word we're really looking for here. The culture is different. You, it feels different. And it feels more trustworthy. And every move that Joe Shane is making right now, it's, it's check, check, check. And we haven't been able to say that for a long time. So, yeah, Nick, I, I do think that the way they're handling this and the timing, it's crucial and it's going to matter a lot down the road. I think one microcosm to that is the re-signing of Dexter Lawrence, which we all expected to happen, even though it wasn't necessarily a certainty at this time of year, um, at this time of the year last year. But I'll, I'll say, man, think about all the defensive linemen the Giants have let walk after playing phenomenally through their rookie contract, dating back to Lindell Joseph and then Dalvin Tomlinson even more recently. All of these defensive linemen, they go off, they just kill it at other places. And it's kind of become this running thing over the last decade or so with the New York Giants. And now you had Dexter Lawrence. You're like, no, no, we're not going to allow this one to happen. We're going to lock this guy up. We're going to pay him big money. And here he is. He's arguably one of the more dominant or one of the most dominant interior pass rushers. And I'm glad to see Joe Shane actually sees this really good player and have him here long term and i expect nothing but greatness from this guy they value the trenches and that's that's the one thing i was hoping this front office would do i mean that they offered two huge contracts to a defensive tackle which is a growing trend in the league right now we're seeing those contracts start to increase as well and because of how much disruption they can do but what sets dexter lawrence apart from some of these other defensive tackles that are also impacting the game in a big way there's a lot of good ones right now aaron donald chris jones theron Payne, jeffrey simmons Lawrence does essentially all of his work in the A-gap. None of those guys do that. And th to get a disruptor, and that's a really hard spot to produce from consistently, run and pass. And then you look at his snap count. He plays more snaps than a lot of these guys at 340 pounds. And then you look at the character. I mean, some of the behind-the-scenes footage that we've seen from Brian Dable when he talks about Dexter Lawrence, I mean, that entire organization loves this kid. I mean, there are no Kadarius Tony type problems with him. We know what we're going to get out of him year in, year out, week in, week out. And it's just, it's, it's a really rare resource that a lot of teams don't have. And I'm glad that Shane, even though he's not an edge rusher, he still paid him top dollar because he knows the impact he can make and the benefit he has uh, on the culture of this team. Yeah. I think you nailed it. Two things, two things there that I wanted to touch on. One, 
I noticed both after both Thomas today and Dexter Lawrence signed his contract. This was back in the earlier in the offseason. I, I followed and I tracked both of their post contract interviews. And you can just go back yourself, look through them, read them. You can either read them on BBI or, or watch them or find the video on uh, Giants have it on their YouTube. Just listen to how humble they are in discussing their contract. Listen to how, how they basically just tell you straight up, this isn't going to change anything about me. This is going to change who I am. I'm not going to go out and buy something crazy here. I'm going to come back and work my ass off as if this didn't happen. And it's so interesting to me that both of that you mentioned the character there because I don't think you get that with every big contract you sign. Some of these contracts you see at other positions with some of the big profile players in the NFL, we're two years into it and they're asking for a new contract or they're trying right. to you know hold out. I don't really foresee that happening with either of these two players. I I think they're locked in here and they're going to move forward. And that's really important. And another thing you mentioned earlier about the culture, something I thought was interesting. It was either a report that came out recently, or maybe I don't think it was a quote. I think it was a report about how Brian Dable in his past coaching tenure, like maybe it was during his time. I think it was with the Patriots, not during his time with the bills. He talked about the importance of when you establish that culture, it's really important not to take a step back in it. And having someone like Barkley hold out would have been a big step back in what they're trying to build from a culture standpoint. And the same could be, could have been said about Dexter Lawrence or Thomas. We don't, no, I mean, there wasn't any reports about this, but we don't know if they could have potentially held out for a new contract, Dexter Lawrence, especially in his position. And that would have also been a big step back. And because they got these deals done, they didn't take that step back. And so I was going to ask you a question next side, but I think you kind of yeah. answered already. If you would have yeah. done anything differently at all, if you were Joe Shane this off season with the big four contracts that were in play here, Barkley Jones, Dex and Thomas sounds like definitely not on Dex and Thomas, anything different on Jones or Barkley, or that would have been how you would have played it as well. I put together a, a pretty lengthy like research project on Dana Jones when I thought he should have been paid. And I do think he was an overpay by about 10 to 15 um, percent okay. just on a per year basis. And I say that because I don't think he would have gotten that what the Giants paid him. I do not believe he would have gotten that on the open market. And it, it, it but it's hard. It, all it takes is one crazy owner to say, I'm like, hey, I want that guy. Carolina was the one team that I felt matched up positionally need wise with before the trade up to number one overall uh before uh and, and also the coach you know they they bring in um they bring right. the coach from the Colts, uh, frank Reich. he he's him and daniel jones they would mesh well together uh but the, the fact that they traded up to one that kind of took them off the list and i thought the giants were almost kind of competing against themselves there uh maybe maybe washington could have went after him but th that was one slight overpay but it wasn't anything egregious, and I don't believe it's going to be something that really impedes them from spending elsewhere down the road. Uh, but Daniel Jones, he's going to have to produce now. There are no more like, hey, the team not around you isn't that good. The offensive system is, around you is no longer efficient. Um, it, he's going to have enormous expectations that he must meet now. And the one positive, and I don't want this to happen, the Giants can get out of this deal in a couple of years. You know, so this is really going to be a, a two-year kind of tryout for Jones. Um, the cutting him off at that point will be expensive to do. But you know, if, if you're going to start going to that forty to forty-five mil ter, uh, per year number, uh, you're going to have enormous expectations. And I hope he's ready for him. Let's focus here on Daniel Jones for a second, David. Dan and I, we, we've talked about Daniel Jones a lot. We, we have critiqued Daniel Jones. We have our issues with Jones, and we also feel like Daniel Jones has a lot of utility, as we saw last season. So for Daniel Jones to live up to that contract, what does David Syverson need to see on the football field for you to feel comfortable with that fact? One thing, I need to see him throw the ball downfield with much more effectiveness. And I know he didn't have the weapons last year. You could even make the case the offensive line wasn't as good as some people were saying last year. They actually were not. It's still a bottom 10 offensive line to me. We can get into them at some point too. The efficiency of the offense took one of the biggest jumps we've ever seen from one season to the next. When you talk about red zone conversion rate, um, they were last in the league. Okay, so red zone conversion rate on a per-play basis. Mm -hmm. This is from Warren Sharp Sports. Okay, number 32 in 2021, seventh best in the NFL in 2022. Uh, in 30th in success rate on all plays. Okay, that's third to last in the NFL. This is in the red zone, number one in 2022. Uh, number 32 in past success and past CPA per play. In 2021, they were number 32. In 2022, they were number one. You're talking about literally worst in the NFL to best in the NFL. 
The problem is we just didn't see them get there often enough. And the efficiency of the offense to me has much more to do with the system and the coaching. And we talked about this, and I know you guys have done a great job, and I know you're going to do a great job breaking this down again. The, the tape, the, the, the play calling, the personnel packaging, the innovation, the deception, right, the modern offense, these guys have it. That's system-based. They can make bad quarterbacks or low-level quarterbacks look much better than they are. San Francisco with Brock Purdy. No, Brock Purdy looked better than he is because right. of that system last year. And I think Daniel Jones at this stage is much on a much higher level than Brock Purdy, but the comparison is the same. So now it's going to be up to Daniel Jones now that he, A, is in year two of the system, and B, has better weapons around him, that he's going to have to have more success throwing the ball downfield. When you can get more explosive plays, 20-plus yard plays down the field, it increases your odds of scoring touchdowns or at the very least scoring points by a ridiculous amount. If you have one of those plays, it usually increases your odds by 40%. If you have one play on that drive of 20 plus yards, the Giants were dead last in explosive plays from the passing game last year. So this is something that, and it's, I'll tell you what, it's almost impossible, but not quite impossible, but almost impossible to make your offense more efficient and more explosive in one year. So let's not say that we were expecting that last year. But I can think of multiple instances that one pass to Darius Slayton that stands out in my head. Jones did have looks downfield, and he did not execute. And this was something that we saw out of him at Duke as a prospect when he was coming into the NFL before the Giants drafted him. So there's no bias here. There's no bias for or against him, right? My report on him was a second-round pick that I thought he could be Ryan Tannehill. That was always my line with him. Could This guy could probably be Ryan Tannehill at the NFL, meaning if everything around him is good, he will look like a pro bowler. But if things start to go south or if he's the one that needs to step up, I'm not sure if he can do it. Great athlete. You know, he averaged seven yards per scramble. He averaged less than that as a passer on yards per attempt, which that's a pretty rare number right there. But again, that's part of his arsenal. So I'm not saying he needs to be Patrick Mahomes, Joe Burrow, Justin Herbert as a passer because he's a better runner than almost everyone in the NFL at that position. I could probably think of three guys that are better runners than Daniel Jones. So let's say that's part of his arsenal. But in this league, and to sustain him long-term and keep him off the injury list, we can't have him carrying the ball 10 times a game. You know, we can't have him taking those hits. He's not very good at avoiding hits, Right. We need to see more success as a downfield passer. That's the number one thing I want to see. Yeah, I think that was a very fair evaluation of Daniel Jones. I know some people don't like to hear any any critiques on the player, and I understand that, but because you feel, uh, oh, well, he never had the receivers, he never had the offensive line. But there are ways to evaluate this position independent of the O-line and receiver. We've been trying to get that across for a while. I think you did a good job of that right there, Cy. But I want to dive a little deeper into the Jones thing. So, I'll say this. I feel like you nailed this one. The red zone offense was a much better, was obviously much better. You brought up all the stats. It's the explosive plays that the Giants need to do better at in the passing game. For example, the Giants had, what was it, 16 passing touchdowns last year? 13 of them were inside the 20 yard line, only three outside of that. So it's not an offense right now that's creating those numbers. But I will say this about the red zone offense, because in the past, we have mentioned how at least Nick and I have mentioned, and you brought this up, scheme is such an important factor there. Design is an important factor there. And let's be honest, we went through the tape, and a lot of these were were product of design. But one thing he did a lot better, I thought he improved a lot better at last year, Daniel Jones, that I hadn't seen really any point in his career prior to that, including the Shermer season, was his ability to create inside the red zone. There were plays, especially in the end of the season, where he would break the pocket, step up through it, move to his right and then find a receiver in a scramble drill that wasn't open right away. So I thought that was a major sign of improvement there with Jones. What exactly are you looking for? Uh, I guess, let me, let me phrase this another way. What would, in your mind, what would lead to Jones creating more of those plays outside of the red zone? What would have to happen with him for that to happen? Well, it, it's not just him, but Jalen Hyatt, I think is one of the biggest X factors on this offense. And I hate to say that about a rookie. I hate to say that about a rookie that's going to be making an enormous jump in complexity of offensive scheme. The way that yeah. I mean, he's going to be on the field. I don't know if he's going to be on the field for more than 15 to 20 snaps a game, especially early on. I could be wrong, though. And I don't believe he's going to be a slot. 
I think they're going to leave him on the outside as much as they can. I mean, they have so many slot receivers on this team. They have Darren Waller, who's going to be in the slot as well, that I think Hyatt's position, Hyatt's role will be on the outside. Whether you're throwing him the ball downfield or he's stretching the defense to create opportunities underneath, he's going to be a factor. And, you know, I, I think he he and Jones need to have that connection. I, I hope they can both stay healthy, especially Hyatt, that they, he can be on the field and have some – chemistry developed during camp preseason and the first half of the season so that when they get into October, November football, they really can start relying on him to be that Will Fuller type. But what Will Fuller did for Deshaun Watson's passing game, it wasn't an every down impact in terms of targets, but Deshaun Watson had his best is when Will Fuller was healthy and it wasn't often enough, but I think that's where Jalen Hyatt can really contribute to this offense. The other side of it is, it's going to be the offensive line. They allowed pressure under two and a half seconds. So two and a half seconds is, is the line. Your offensive line needs to avoid pressure for more than that. If you're under that, your, your, offense, your downfield passing game won't exist. And they, were, they allowed pressure under two and a half seconds at the fifth highest rate in the NFL last year. And this is what I mean where if I had to pick one area of that giant struggle, those five, six years of struggle football, right, where it was really hard to watch. We can blame this. We can blame that. The position group that held this group back the most was the offensive line. So our outlook on that position group, the barometer we had for what is a quality offensive line, I think a lot of Giants fans have lost it because what we consider to be a quality offensive line right now, it, it needs to be higher. This was not a good offensive line last year. I still think it was one of the worst seven lines in football. We were just used to seeing one of the worst, either like the worst or second worst in the NFL. So we need to see a a step up. So I don't want to put all of this on Jones. You cannot have a downfield passing game without a reliable offensive line. You have Andrew Thomas. You have Mark Lewinsky, who's not a star, but you know what you're getting out of him. But the three other spots, if two of them work out, I believe this offensive line will be good enough. But we need someone to step into that left guard spot, take the bull by the horns, and it not be a rotational position. We need especially Evan Neal to do what Andrew Thomas did. It's okay that you struggled as a rookie, and he was. He was probably the worst rookie offensive lineman in the entire NFL last year. Okay, that's okay. Andrew Thomas is bad as a rookie as well. But we need to see improvement, and I'm optimistic there. It's not just because I had to draw a high prospect rate on him out of Alabama. One thing that I've been talking about for years now with him is – 2023 will be the first time since he was in high school that he's playing the same position back-to-back years. And we talk about player development. A lot of people overlook this as well. When you're talking about why are the good teams in the NFL really good? Yes, they draft well. They are responsible with their finances. They have a quarterback. Good coaching. Player development. These guys should be getting better every single year for, throughout their entire rookie contract. And because Evan Neal does not need to make a position change again, right? Left tackle high school, right guard as a freshman at Alabama, right tackle in the second year, left tackle in his third year, goes back to right tackle once he gets the NFL. Now we should see some more consistency out of him because it wasn't that he was a bad football player last year. He was just inconsistent. So now we're looking at those two spots. I'm really looking at the offensive line early in the year, right tackle, left, left guard, and then you have a rookie playing center. I know they haven't handed him the job. Schmitz is going to be the, is going to be the starter at center. So you have three spots. If two of them can take a step up from what we saw last year, I think that will be a huge factor into Daniel Jones taking his game to the next level. David, other than the consistency that we need to see from Evan Neal, what from a technical standpoint do you feel like Evan Neal really struggled with last season? Consistency in foot placement. And when your feet are kind of all over the place, it creates balance issues. And that was the one negative that we talked about. I talked about that with you guys before and after the draft um, with Evan Neal, that the one thing you would see on his tape at Alabama that you didn't love, that most good tackles have, is balance and body control. Um, you saw it, it, it would pop up weekly. And it, it's, a, it's not an athleticism shortcoming. He actually, when you just measure pure athletic ability, he's actually – maybe even a better athlete than Andrew Thomas. He's on that same level, I'll say that. Maybe not better. He's on the same tier. But the skill of the position, there's athletic ability and then there's skill. 
skill is being able to repeat your movement patterns over and over like clockwork. Like you guys walk up and down stairs. You don't think about it. You've done it so many times. Right. It's natural to you. His footwork is not natural. And because his footwork is not natural and because he's a heavy dude, he just never was really, to, he was never able to consistently put all of his power into contact with defenders. So if he can square that up and play bounce, he is, he's almost immovable. And I don't, if we see the best of Evan Neal, you're going to have Evan Neal and Andrew Thomas as the best tackle combination in the NFL in the next couple of years. If Evan Neal hit, reaches his ceiling, and I mean that. Yeah, I love that call. And I think you bring up a really good point. I remember watching Evan Neal at the Combine. Video came out of him doing box jumps, and I, it was unbelievable for a guy. Yeah. His, his athleticism is very underrated. But I love that you mentioned that because I don't hear this often discussed with offensive line. It is a lot, in a lot of ways, a skill position. It's not a skill position by like our standards, running back, receiver, whatever. But it's a skill position in the sense that like just like golf or tennis, it's a repeated motion in those sports that, for your swing. Just like you said, with getting into your stance, it's a repeated motion for you to be an offensive tackle. It's a lot different than a lot of these other positions in that regard. And that's part of why I think Andrew Thomas is so special. He's so smooth with it. And the feet are everything, man. Like, I feel like for that position, I've made I, I'm not going to say I've made strides in evaluating it, but I've changed how I evaluate it. And a lot of my focus has been on the footwork with Sean Slater, Charles Cross. These are players with great footwork on film in college that ended up hitting immediately at the NFL level versus other guys who have struggled at the NFL level, Eric Flowers, whatever, that have the size, the power, all these other things you might want to look for. I say look at the feet. The feet are mm -hmm. everything for an offensive line. The rest of it can come like size. You want to talk about Charles Cross being undersized, Rashawn Slater being undersized, Rashawn Slater not having the length to play tackle. None of those actually mattered once they got to the NFL because their feet were so sound. And like you said, yeah. they perfected that skill. So I think it's a good thing to look at. I want to keep the focus on the offensive line, though, because I want to get your opinion on a transition from college to the NFL. You mentioned how you think John Michael Schmitz will be the center. I think Nick and I both agree by the time September rolls around. I know first practice today uh, was today and Bredesen was the first team center and they had a Zudo at left guard. We'll see how long that lasts. I'm with you. Mm -hmm. I think it will be John Michael Schmitz. But I think it's interesting. It's hard to make the jump as fans for expectations for a guy playing in the Big Ten or any conference than going to the NFL. What would be a fair expectation for Giants fans who are listening to have for John Michael Schmitz in year one? Is a fair expectation a top 16 center? Is a fair expectation a top 10 center? Or should they be expecting maybe some early struggles? That's a good question because center is different than tackle. You're not left alone on an island. You're not faced up against the freakiest athletes in the NFL. That's another thing you got to give some leeway to some of these tackles that come out of college. The edge rushers in the NFL right now are just you could say they're the biggest freaks in the league. Yeah. So if you're off by a little bit, you just get exposed a lot more where you're a center. You have help on both sides. There's a lot of traffic. There's a lot of, you know, a lot of action around on both sides. You can get away with a little bit more. So if there's a metric, you know, and this is hard to do with the offensive line, but I think a rookie center that you draft a two, he should be one of the best 20 centers in football. I think that's realistic for, for Schmitz um, top half right away. I, I think that's that would be a huge win if he ends up in that tier. I wouldn't put it past him. One of the things that can be really hard about playing center early on in the NFL is the complexity of blocking schemes and how much responsibility these guys need to take on. My guess is that's why Brent Bredesen is probably going to have the inside track early on. But in terms of talent and effectiveness, I had to think Schmitz is just simply a better football player and – Keeping coaching simple, you got to put your best football players on the field. And he's a better football player than Bredesen. Bredesen, I think his value is that he can back up all three interior spots. And that is valuable because these guys do get hurt. But Schmitz, as soon as he has a full grasp of the playbook and the protections and the chemistry between right to left, the communication factor that a center needs to do, that probably will be his job. But if he does struggle to pick that up, that's one thing college the NFL – take Big Ten out of it. I think college and NFL, the complexity of these schemes, it, it's learning a new language, but also going from pre-calculus to calculus. Like it's just much more information, much more in-depth. And oh, by the way, you know, you're face up against Dexter Lawrence and Leonard Williams every day in practice. You know, it's, <laughs> it's a lot to take on early on, but I think that's a fair expectation from a second rounder that he should be one of the best 20 centers uh, in football uh, this season.
he's going to learn with those two going up against yes, him. Yes, he will, that whether way. he wants to or not. <laughs> yes, I have one more question on the offensive line from me, just because the left guard position, if John Michael Schmitz is ultimately the starting center, it's up in the air right now. And I want to just get your opinion on the battle between Ben Bredesen and Josh Azudu. Mm. I was a huge Josh Dezudu fan coming out of North Carolina. Tackle guard combo at that program. And I remember it wasn't with you guys. It was some scouts on our podcast. They said, hey, take evaluation out of it in terms of grades. Who are just some of your favorite f- football players in this class? And I gave them five. One of them was Wandale Robinson. And the other one was Dezudu. I believe in this kid. I think he should. And I think this front office wants him to win that left guard job. When you talk about the ceiling of what that left guard position can be, he has the highest one. But he also, coming off a neck injury, which he's obviously been cleared, right? There were a couple of rumors that this could have been a serious issue. He did have surgery. So I'm glad he's back on the field. I don't know if that impacted a lot of his offseason training because that's one thing that I saw on Tate. He did have a, a solid power game in college. The tape that we saw on him in the NFL last year, I thought he got pushed around a little bit. I thought he struggled with some leverage issues. He was great on the move, which I expected. He played tackle in college. Uh, but, you know, he, he like Evan Neal, needs to play a lot better than he did last year when you, when you take everything in. He allowed a little too much pressure, and his secondary contact wasn't very good, meaning he got a lot of initial wins. But the second he was matched up against someone with good secondary pass rush moves, he didn't do a good job of mirroring. He was a little out of control. That was the one thing I kept on writing down about him in my post-game evaluations. He just didn't show the necessary control and confidence to stay in front of his man over and over. So if, if this guy takes another step up like Evan Neal, he's the best guard on this team. The best left. I would even say better than Mark Lewinsky. But the floor is a little bit lower with him. Mark Lewinsky, I know he's not going to go earn any Pro Bowl honors next year, but you know where his floor is. Right now, we don't know where Ezidu's floor is, and that's a little bit of a danger game right there. I think it's interesting that you bring up Lewinsky, Cy, because the way you've discussed him is a player different than what I've heard fans discuss him. And I think the common perception with Glinsky is that he was a total bust last year because of that middle of the season range. But if you really break it down and look at it as a whole and take a step back, Glowinski had a pretty good uh, final stretch with the Giants toward the end of the season, including through the playoffs, and a good stretch at the beginning of the season. He was more, it, it, maybe you can call him an inconsistent player, but he offers the Giants a little bit more in my mind than people are cr- crediting for right now. And so I'm interested to see if maybe second year in the system, he can start to put together more consistent tape because I'm not totally out on him, even though I do feel like maybe the best case scenario is Azuto Bredesen, but I'm not certain on that. But I want to ask you about one position that, or one area of the offensive line, and we'll wrap up offensive line after this it just doesn't get discussed a lot but to me it's important it's always goes back to my debate that i have with people on twitter about how i view qb2 as a much more important position than they do to me it's one of the more important positions on the roster it's the most important backup position and i will put resources into it because i think it's the most important position in football why am i not caring about qb2 so same thing goes for me with swing tackle. I'm a little concerned right now with the Giants swing tackle position right now. It doesn't get this. We haven't seen it discussed a lot this offseason. We haven't even discussed it much yet. Nick and I, we plan to probably throughout the offseason. But where are you at with that? What are your expectations for who could potentially win that job? Are you out completely on paired? Is there any hope for Matt Paired? I mean, based on tape and injury history, I, I think Paired is, I don't even know if he's going to make it through the preseason. He'll be there for camp. But it is a valuable position. But between his tape, between his injury, between the lack of progress and the fact that this regime did not draft him, you know, and he he was drafted as a project. We knew that. It was a high ceiling project because his best football was quality and the tools are all there. But I think it's going to be Tyree Phillips. And don't sleep on Marcus McKeithen. I know he's on the PUP and I know he's a guard. But there were some rumors. There were some talk last year, chatter last year when I was at camp that he was going to get a look at tackle. And if you watch him move and you watch him play, he does look more like a tackle than a guard. So I think that there's a possibility we're going to see this guy get some looks there at some point. But because he's on the PUP list right now, that might impede how quickly that can happen. But Tyree Phillips is the guy that I feel best about should someone go down. The question to me is if it's Andrew Thomas that goes down, would you consider shifting Evan Neal over there? And to me, we just talked about player development 
And we know he's going to be the long-term right tackle. He's not going to all of a sudden take Andrew Thomas' spot. That guy's locked in, you know, for the next five, six years. My suggestion would be keep, keep Neil where he is, fully develop him there, and Tyree Phillips goes on the left side. Discussion possibly for another time, but I think Tyree Phillips is the best swing tackle we've had since I've been covering the Giants. I, I don't really know of another swing tackle situation where I felt more comfortable than I do about Tyree Phillips. But David, I want to get one question just – Knowing Mike Kafka, as we know him just from studying him last season, with all of the additions that the New York Giants made, Darren Waller, Paris, all of these additions, what are you most looking forward to from the offense heading into the season? Darren Waller and, and how they're going to implement him with Daniel Bellinger because Bellinger, you know, he's not the kind of player that you're going to not go after Darren Waller because of. Does that make sense? Like Darren Waller is a player that can really ch change this passing game. But Daniel Bellinger was a good player last year as a rookie at a position where it's really hard to have immediate success as a rookie. I mean, you look around just his historically, rookie tight ends have a really hard time because they're really coming in having to learn two positions, offensive line caliber position, trench blocking, and then running routes and catching footballs. And Bellinger, in my opinion, I mean, he had one of the highest catch rates in the NFL. I think among tight ends with the X amount of targets, I think it was more than 40 targets. Mm -hmm. I think he had – the highest catch rate in the NFL at the position, you know, and obviously the, the depth of target wasn't very high and didn't get a ton. Of, he wasn't a huge part of the passing game, but the fact that he came in right away as a fourth rounder from San Diego state, took that week one starter job and played at a high level, unfortunate injury to the eye slowed him down a little bit. Uh, but we saw what was on this team beyond him. You know, that, that offense, in my opinion, it struggled without mm -hmm. Daniel Bellinger a little bit. So, you put him and Darren Waller on the field at the same time, Bellinger in line, Waller as a big slot, it gives you something unique. And it gives you something that Mike Kafka has a lot of experience working with. A Travis Kelsey type athlete as a slot receiver from your tight end. And that's just, I'm really excited to see what he can do. I mean, his depth of target last year was one of the highest, if not the highest in the league. Now he's coming to an offense that doesn't throw the ball downfield that much. But at least we know Waller can go down the field and get the ball. And, you know, the injury issue, that's always going to be a concern. But this was a worthy risk, taking uh, a good risk for the Giants to take. And all these other receivers that they brought in, Campbell, Jameson Crowder, Cole Beasley now, right? Um, those are all nice pieces. I wouldn't get too excited about them. But Darren Waller is the guy that I think could change the offense. And I think we're also going to see, it's so interesting. We saw today in the first training camp practice, Waller was even being motioned into the backfield, which I just didn't expect to see from him. But it's like they're finding different creative ways to use him. He was apparently really well utilized in the red zone and difficult to cover. I wonder if we'll also start to see, as I know you mentioned, it's it's not as much, we haven't seen as much with Kansas City and uh, Kafka and Kelsey, but I wonder if we'll start to see some some three by one sets with Waller as the one. And then you got Bellinger still on the field there as, as almost like the big slot in the three by one. Cause then you have a chance to really, cause you mentioned like the offense took a step back with Bellinger. I think a lot of that was in the run game. I think what Bellinger offered in the run game, they weren't just able, they weren't just weren't able to do with the cagers and the Tanner Hudson's and whoever else they had to put in the Myricks when Bellinger was absent. So I think with him on the field, with both them on the field at the same time, it kind of gives the giants that balance, that ability to make defenses, catch defenses off guard. You don't know if it's going to be a run. You don't know if it's going to be a pass. The giants can roll out 12, 13 personnel, and that's not a real 12, 13 personnel package. So now you're putting the ball in the opposing defensive coordinators court. Like, Hey, what personnel are you going to bring out? Cause we're going to find a way to exploit that. And if Darren Waller can block even marginally for a tight end, with Saquon Barkley now back and the Giants offensive line hopefully taking a step forward, you can establish that run. They're going to bring in bigger personnel package. Good luck covering the play action pass out of this 12 personnel. Absolutely. I mean, that that's a huge thing that I was going to say is that the you trust there's a lot of cohesion here between the front office, who they're trading for, who they're drafting, who they're signing, right? Is with, with the offensive system, they were so good at this last year of really not having a clear-cut system on offense. And you could say the same thing about the defense, too. When you just look at some of the personnel uses that they would change up week to week based on who they were playing against. So this is why you, you feel a lot of trust in this current operation of coaching and front office that at the very least, even if the personnel just isn't quite there yet, which is I still feel that way about this team. It's not quite there yet. 
to be a, a true contender, to, to really compete with the Eagles, right? But everyone else, the middle tier, the lower tier, the NFL, I think the Giants can outsmart them. And now the talent is good enough that now that he could put these guys in position to make plays that they're not going to be easy to game plan against. And I think that's where I'm kind of building off your point, Nick. This is going to be a very difficult team offensively and defensively for opposing teams to prepare for. Yeah, I love that last point you made because something that always concerns me in the NFL is when you have like eight games of film on a system or on a way of style of offense, because you mentioned it earlier and I know Nick agrees. We've talked about it so often. We honestly feel like most of the offensive success in the big jump last year was coaching based. I know a lot of people give it the credit to Jones. Some give it to Barkley to us in our mind from the film we watch. It was design based and it was play calling based. And that scares me for this season as far as Jones goes. But then I take a step back and I think, should it really scare me? Because they're not going to run out the same system. They change so often. Like you mentioned, they change the personnel groupings. They change how they attack based on the defense and the defense coordinators they face. They change the formation. They started doing things at the end of the season. We didn't see the beginning of the season. So it also, it, it, it works to kind of quell my concern. And I, and I look at it like, yeah, there's film now on what the Giants did and what Jones did successfully last year with this coaching staff, but they're going to change enough that I feel like that's going to be the biggest difference there, and that's going to keep this offense on track. The, the schedule that they're going to be faced up against this year, it's going to be a lot more difficult than what they had, and the Giants were 2-7 and seven against teams that finished with a winning record last year, so we need to keep that in mind. And the way that they start the season off, Dallas, San Fran, Seattle, Miami, Buffalo, that's five of their first six games right there. And four of those games are in prime time. Daniel Jones is one and nine career in prime time. Uh, more interceptions than touchdowns, 74.2 QB rating, 5.9 yards per attempt. You know, th the work is going to be, we're going to know pretty early on, Dan, if this is going to be an issue that the league is starting to catch on to what these guys are doing on a macro level. Uh, but it's going to come down to that this, the players on this team, now that they're being paid, they need to be better. It's not just the coaching that they're going to have to rely on anymore. Hey friends, Nick Filato here. This concludes the first portion of the David Syverson interview. If you want to listen to the second portion, please scroll through our feed. You will find it. It'll also be up on our YouTube shortly. Thank you. Take care of yourself.